Hello, and welcome to this fifth uh, loose lecture on college chaplaincy. We're delighted to have all of you here. Um, I'm Jim Fraser. I'm a professor of history and education at uh, NYU Steinhardt, and I'm co-director of the NYU Chaplaincy Initiative, which this lecture is part of. Um, note that you're being recorded. This second lecture is being recorded, so we're, we're now live. Um, these loose lectures are part of a joint project at NYU Steinhardt's, at linking the NYU Steinhardt School and the of many Institute for Multi-Faith Leadership. Um, here at NYU, our project has a three-part focus. We have a doctoral program in higher education administration, which has an option for people to focus on college chaplaincy uh, within that program. We have a summer institute for college chaplains, which is sponsored by the of many Institute. And of course, we have these lectures, uh, which they is part of the loose lectures uh, on college chaplaincy, where we're creating a, a much larger conversation about uh, chaplaincy. We are most grateful to the Henry Luce Foundation, which is supporting all of this work and making it all possible. Uh, and we are, their support has been essential to this whole enterprise. I want to take just a moment to say a couple of special welcomes to Melissa Carter, who is the uh, co-director of this project and the director of the Multi-Faith Institute, uh, and our work together is, is making this possible. I want to welcome our former NYU president, John Sexton, who during his tenure was crucial in making religious life so vibrant here at NYU. I want to welcome our current Dean of the Steinhardt School, Jack Knott, who worked with Dr. Sony at USC and who's also supporting all of us. And a special thank you to Brittany Lauer, who is our uh, coordinator of this project and making sure that these lectures are in fact working as well as all the rest of our projects. So, and most of all, I want to say a special welcome to all of you, the now 65 participants in this lecture. Uh, we are just delighted that you are here and able to participate with us today. So with that, let me introduce uh, Vinit Chander, who is a coordinator of Hindu life and Hindu chaplain at Princeton University, and also the Vera and Sam S. Jane Fellow in the Deaf Studies here at NYU Steinhardt and a student in the doctoral program in higher education administration focusing on issues of chaplaincy. Um, Vineet Chander will uh, moderate the rest of this conversation, introduce Dr. Sony, and handle questions when we get to questions. So, Vineet, I will hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Jim, and, and thanks to all of you for attending. Um, we have a great turnout, and we're so delighted by that. This afternoon, uh, we are just overjoyed to be joined by Dr. Varun Soni. Varun serves as the Vice Provost for Campus Wellness and Crisis Intervention, as well as the Dean of Religious Life at USC, and also serves as a University Fellow at USC Annenberg's Center on Public Diplomacy. That we are able to host Varun Soni is, um, I don't think it's a secret, um, is of special significance to me because Varun is not only a friend and colleague, but someone I very much consider uh, a role model and, and one of my heroes. Um, Varun is the first and only Hindu American to serve as a Dean of Religious Life at a college or university, and among only a small handful of non-Christians in that position more generally. As Dean, he brings together the spiritual and scholarly resources of the university. He provides moral and ethical leadership for the USC community. And he works closely with the 90 student religious groups and more than 40 religious directors on campus. He also oversees interfaith engagement and community service initiatives. He organizes interdisciplinary events that explore religion broadly conceived and leads ceremonial events and observances ranging from vigils and memorials to celebrations and commemorations on campus and now virtually. As Vice Provost, Varun leads the advancement of mental health and wellness education, 
harm reduction initiatives, and prevention strategies for all members of the USC community. He works closely with campus partners, such as the Department of Public Safety and Fire Safety and Emergency Planning to coordinate crisis response and intervention. Born in India and raised in Southern California, Farun has family on five continents and they collectively represent every major religious tradition in the world. The vibrancy of religious life amidst plurality is perhaps in his DNA. Now I should add that Varun and I are both members of a very special exclusive club, and that is the South Asian former attorneys with names that start with the letter V and who are incredibly good looking society. Uh, Valerie Kaur is also a member of, of the society. Varun is a member of the State Bar of California and prior to joining USC, he spent four years teaching in the law and society program at UCSB. In addition to his JD, which was earned at the UCLA School of Law, where he completed the critical race studies program and also served as an editor for the Journal of Islamic and Near Eastern Law. Varun also has a BA in religion from Tufts University, an MTS from Harvard Divinity School, and he earned his PhD through the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Cape Town where his doctoral work focused on religion and popular culture. But for Varun, the intersections of religion, spirituality, culture, race, justice, peace building, these are not merely academic interests. They are robust areas of exploration and engagement. As an undergraduate, he spent a semester living in a Buddhist monastery in Bodh Gaya. As a graduate student, he spent months doing field research in India through UCSB's Center for Sikh and Punjab Studies. Currently, he sits on the advisory board for the Center for Muslim Jewish Engagement, the Music Preservation Project, Cross Currents, and the Journal for Interreligious Dialogue. He produced and hosted his own radio show, showcasing music from South Asia and its diaspora. He's written about the spirituality of Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan and Bob Marley. He's produced a graphic novel and has been featured in documentaries. Never one to shy away from a passion project or from the prospect of breaking new ground, Varun Soni is, we might say, something of a Renaissance man. I am so honored and delighted to have the opportunity to play host to my dear friend, my colleague, my spiritual brother. Folks, we are in for a treat. Please join me in giving Dean Varun Soni a very warm NYU welcome. Wow, thank you, Vineet, for that extremely generous introduction. I wish my wife, who thinks you're better looking, by the way, was there to hear that. Um, she, she would say, wow, I wanna meet that interesting guy. I'm almost nervous to speak after that because it feels like it's all gonna be downhill. The expectations are too high now, but uh, I'm super grateful to you, Vineet, for everything that you do, uh, for your friendship, for your leadership, um, for being a prophetic voice for uh, our Hindu students and for all students. So thank you for that. Um, really very honored to be here with everyone today. Um, super thankful to James Frazier, who, you know, Jim and I have been talking about this for two years. Uh, and so this was a long road to get here. Thank you so much, Jim. Brittany, thank you for your masterful organization and convening. Uh, us all together at a time, I think, when we really need to be together. I very much appreciate our sponsors today for making this possible, NYU Steinhardt, the NYU of Many Institute for Multi-Faith Leadership, and the Henry Luce Foundation. Um, and um, uh, I'm just really excited and grateful to all of you for being here today. And I have to say it's very special for me to be at NYU. Uh, when my parents immigrated to the United States from India as young physicians, my father did his residency at NYU. And so I grew up right down the street from campus. Um, it's kind of a virtual homecoming for me, but one where I get to enjoy better weather than you. Uh, if my colleague Jack Knott is on, Jack, we miss you at USC. Um, and I bet you miss us in February too. Uh, I also consider NYU here to be a sister school uh, to my university, which is USC. NYU and USC, in my opinion, are the schools that are most like each other. They're bi-coastal versions of each other. They're the two largest private universities in the nation, the two largest international student bodies 
in the nation. There are two urban research universities in the heart of a global metropolis. There are two universities that really excel in digital media and film, two universities that anchor their respective cities in terms of planning policy and practice. And so I believe that the examples and the numbers and the stories that I will share today from my time at USC could just as easily be from NYU. Today, um, we're gonna talk about the future of university chaplaincy, a big topic. Um, and I have a few thoughts about this, but really I'd like to leave ample time for questions and conversations um, because that's really where the magic happens, as you know. And so um, at the end of sort of my remarks, uh, I'll turn it back over to Vineet so we can moderate a conversation amongst uh, all of us. And I really wanna learn from you. Uh, and I hope that what I have to share is helpful to you as well. Listen, we all know that university chaplaincy has an illustrious past. Many of our nation's best research universities were founded as divinity schools and as theological training grounds. And at the heart of many of our nation's most stunning campuses, um, like the one that Vineet works at, Princeton, sits a university church or chapel that signifies that religious and spiritual perspectives, worldviews, and identities matter, and that they have an important role in shaping uh, both the intellectual life and the emotional life of the university. When I was a student at Harvard Divinity School, um, I loved going there knowing that the Div School was Harvard's first school. I loved walking around a beautiful campus that was oriented around the majestic steeple of Memorial Church. It made me feel like I was studying the right stuff at the right place at the right time. That sense of history really animates and inspires the work that so many of us do as religious life professionals. But university chaplaincy also has a very important future too um, that we're looking towards as we stand at this present moment crossroads. And I believe that the future of university chaplaincy will tackle the two most challenging issues for American higher education today, period. And those are the first, the mental, emotional and spiritual health crisis amongst college students. And the second is the aspiration to build an inclusive, diverse and equi equitable uh, campus community. In, in both these areas, I believe that university chaplains can and should be leaders, not just from the perspective of religious and spiritual life, but also from the perspective of university life, because these are challenges that are fundamental and existential for universities right now, and quite frankly, for society as a whole. I am very lucky, as Vineet said, because I get to see the university from a very unique perspective. Indeed, through my many different roles on campus, I get to see and hear uh, the soul of the university, from the agony to the ecstasy, from triumph to tragedy, and from everything in between. In my role as Dean of Religious and Spiritual Life, I'm essentially the university chaplain. Those titles really are a distinction without a difference. Uh, my core responsibilities are similar to those that university chaplains have around the country, uh, to provide confidential pastoral care and spiritual counseling for our university community, to oversee our many student groups and spiritual groups on campus, to increase religious literacy on campus, to develop programs and events that facilitate community service and interfaith engagement, to preside over university events of all kinds, to engage local community and local leaders, et cetera. And I get to do that on a campus, as Vineet said, with more than 90 student religious groups and more than 50 campus chaplains um, representing all the world's great religious traditions, including a humanist chaplain, a Sikh chaplain, a Baha'i chaplain, uh, and to do this work in the heart of one of the most religiously diverse cities in the world. Uh, my old professor and mentor, Diana Eck at Harvard called Los Angeles the most religiously diverse city in the world. NYU probably has a claim to that too, but I'm gonna go with uh, LA. <laughs> and so it, around USC, we have more than a hundred houses of worship within one mile of campus and more than 12,000 houses of worship in our region. So there's never a dull moment in my work as a uh, chaplain for the university. But in my other role as Vice Provost of Campus Wellness and Crisis Intervention, a new role that was developed on my campus after a great tragedy um, when a professor was murdered on our campus, allegedly by his own graduate student, um, I built and now oversee four other core university divisions. I oversee threat assessment, campus well-being, support and intervention, and ombud services. And on a campus of 70,000 people, which is essentially a city within a city, the numbers that my team oversee are huge. We have 3,000 student concern cases a year, 250 threat cases a year, 250 health leaves a year, 700 ombuds visitors a year, and we engage more than 10,000 people every year in our different wellness programs. And from where I sit, from the 40,000 foot view of the university, from the window of the provost office, this is what I see on my campus. It's all crisis all the time. Crisis is the new normal. 
I'm probably the highest ranking university official in the country right now with the word crisis in his, her, or their official title, my title of vice provost of campus wellness and crisis intervention. But I don't like the word crisis because crisis implies non-crisis and there is no non-crisis anymore. There is no period of non-crisis. Crisis is the norm, crisis is the baseline. Universities have their own campus crises. All universities and college have their own DNA and they have their own issues that they have to work with. But I doubt that any university in the United States has had the volume and intensity of campus crises that USC has had over the last five years. Some schools have to toxic leadership crises. Some schools have athletic scandals. Some have hor horrific histories of sexual abuse on campus. Some have admission scandals. Some are wrestling with institutional legacies of racism, discrimination, and eugenics. We have had all of these crises over the last five years at USC. And I was running crisis for the university during all of our national scandals. And so I learned a lot, I saw a lot, and I mourned a lot. And what I noticed is that while the campus crises may look different on each campus, there is a shared crisis that all universities are going through right now, no matter how big or small, no matter whether they're urban or, or, or rural, no matter whether they're colleges or universities, whether they're research or teaching, whether they're predominantly undergrads or grads. And that is what I would call a spiritual crisis. I get to use the language of spiritual crisis as the university chaplain, a spiritual crisis of belonging. And that crisis of belonging implicates well-being and, and it implicates inclusion in ways that I believe require the leadership expertise and vision of cha chaplains on our campuses. When I arrived in 2008, um, as Vineet said, um, I was an unusual choice to be the Dean of Religious and Spiritual Life at USC. Um, I, um, I, around the country, all of my colleagues were ordained Protestant ministers and USC hired me, a non-ordained Hindu attorney. So uh, USC really thought outside the box. Um, but in that role, I get to oversee more religious groups and chaplains probably than anyone in the country, maybe in the world. And when I first got to campus, what I realized was that I was having the same conversations with my students that I had with my university chaplain, Scotty McLennan, who was my mentor at Tufts University and then went on to become my colleague as the Dean for Religious Life at Stanford. Uh, I'm Generation X, and I was speaking with Generation Y, millennials at the time, um, and our conversations were about hopes and dreams. What are my hopes? What are my dreams? How do I live my dreams? How do I live my values? How do I live an authentic life? What does it mean to live a good life? Uh, how do I transform the world by transforming myself? These are the conversations that, um, that made me want to do this work. Uh, these were the conversations that inspired me every day to be around young people. And what I noticed is that even though we were going through a great financial challenge in 2008, 2009, our young people were very excited to go out into the world. They wanted to graduate and go change the world. They wanted to be the change in the world that they wanted to see in the world. They felt very hopeful, very inspired, very confident, maybe overconfident <laughs> about what they could do in the world. About five years ago, I noticed my conversations started to change in really devastating ways. Instead of asking me, why, how should I live? I noticed that students began to ask me, why should I live? And instead of talking about hope, they were talking about hopelessness. Instead of talking about meaning, they were talking about meaninglessness. Uh, and what I thought at the time was, okay, I've just been on campus long enough where pe students who are vulnerable in our crisis know that I'm here and I'm starting to see students who I never saw before. But when I started talking to other chaplains around the country and other counselors around the country, what I realized is that what I was seeing was something entirely new just as they were seeing something entirely new. And that was a full-blown mental health crisis for college students across the country, period. This was pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, what we began to see was that 65% of college students around the country are wrestling with anxiety to the extent where they find it difficult to function. Their anxiety is so great that they're having trouble functioning in life. I, I noticed that 50% of our medical students said they were so anxious they couldn't take care of themselves these are our future caregivers. These are people, these are students who had to move mountains to get to medical school and they're unable to take care of themselves because of anxiety. So if 65% of our students are wrestling with anxiety, anxiety is baseline, anxiety is normal. Anxiety is sort of what we expect at this point. 35% of our students around the country are wrestling with depression and 10% have had thoughts of suicide over the last year. On campuses like USC and NYU, these beautiful idyllic campuses that look like college brochures, it, locations where students have spent their whole lives dreaming about being. On any beautiful day in New York City or Los Angeles on our campuses, uh, where students should be living their dreams, 
uh, on a campus as big as ours, which have 50,000 students. That means that there are 5,000 students on each of our campuses that have thought about uh, suicide, thought about ending their life over the last year. And about 5% of our students, about 2,500 students have actually made a plan. That's what keeps me up at night, actually. That's what keeps me up at night, this um, rising level of suicidal su suicidality and suicidal ideation. And this has tragic consequences, as you can imagine. When I inherited this job um, from my friend and mentor, Rabbi Susan Lemley, who was the first um, non-Christian in American history to be the chief religious or spiritual leader of a university, I believe I'm the second, and she may be on this call, um, Susan, if you are, good to have you, um, I miss you. Um, when, when I inherited this role from Susan, we, we usually had about one death every other month, and they were usually so-called acts of God. Uh, which are sort of car crashes or terminal illness, things that happened but felt like they were outside the scope of what we could have done to prevent them. Um, now we usually we have about a student death every month, so that's doubled. Um, and now the majority of our deaths are not acts of God, but so-called acts of man, uh, mostly suicide and accidental drug overdoses. And what I've noticed on my campus is that when you have deaths that are the result of the acts of man as opposed to acts of God, you're not just left with grief, but you're also left with guilt. We have a campus that's really wrestling with um, what could I have done differently? What should I have done? I knew my friend was in trouble. Why didn't I engage? Why didn't I intervene, et cetera? And it's not just students who think that, it's parents, it's faculty, it's staff, it's all of us who feel as though we should have done more. And this was most apparent to me in the fall of 2019 when at my university, we lost 12 students over 15 weeks in the fall semester. I'd never been through anything like that. I'd never seen the emotional climate of our campus like that. I've done way too many memorial services. I've sat with way too many grieving parents. As a parent myself, this becomes really hard. It used to be um, something I could do, and now it's not, it's not really something I can bear anymore. Those parents live with me. Um, their stu those students live with me, um, and it gets worse every year. It gets worse every year. What I began to notice pre-COVID was that at the heart of the anxiety, depression, uh, when I began to scratch the surface of students who were um, suicidal or who were wrestling with other kinds of mental health challenges or conditions, um, I, there, was a, there was a question I kept getting asked that I never got asked in the first six or seven years of my career. And I was getting asked all the time. And that question was, how do I make friends and I began to think that was strange. Here's a campus full of young people. Why are they asking me, the old man on the corner of campus, how to make friends when there's 50,000 students uh, on campus? Um, but what I began to see was that this was the result of a epidemic of loneliness that is plaguing our students. Uh, there was a recent survey by Cigna, which is a, a health organization. And uh, the survey showed that actually it's not the oldest people in the United States who are the loneliest anymore. We always used to think of, um, loneliness as, um, as something that afflict, afflicted the elderly and that could be uh, a cause for premature death. We know that loneliness has a physical health impact. The equivalent of you know, being really lonely is smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It, it impacts your lifespan. We always thought this was something that was a challenge for older Americans. I never assumed it was a challenge for younger Americans, but what Cigna said in their survey was that the loneliest gen people in the United States are not the oldest, but the youngest, Generation Z, post-millennials, and amongst post-millennials, the loneliest people in the United States are 18 to 22 year olds. What does that mean? That means that the loneliest people in the United States are the age of our undergraduate students. Our undergraduates are in this cohort of, 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 of folks that are extremely lonely. And so I, read, I wrote an article about this a few years ago in the LA Times. It was an op-ed and it was, um, I think the title was The Real Crisis on College Campuses Loneliness. And I was surprised how that went kind of viral around the world. I got emails, I still get emails years later from people all over the world who work with young adults who tell me that what I'm seeing at USC, this crisis of loneliness and disconnection, this sense that people feel like they don't belong, this increasing sense that students feel like they're imposters on their own campuses was not unique to USC in any way, shape or form. It was a generational trend that played out on college and university campuses around the world. And it corresponded generationally. I noticed my conversation started to shift when post-millennials got to campus, when Gen Y began to leave and Gen Z began to arrive. It was almost in real time that we began to see this uh, mental health crisis as it impacts this particular generation. And so what's going on here? Why is Generation Z more depressed pre-COVID than 
uh, young people were during the Great Depression. How are they more anxious pre-COVID than college students were during World War II? College students who were going to fight in World War II. How are our students more anxious? Well, uh, I think there are a number of factors uh, and I'd love to learn from all of you, but I think there are two predominant factors that make this generation very different than any other generation in American history, maybe in human history. Uh, the first is obviously that this is these that our students are the first digital natives in human history. They were raised talking with their thumbs. We were raised talking with our tongues. For a hundred thousand years, we've been communicating like this. We've been in community, like it, we've been in in-person community. And with this generation of students, with Generation Z, post millennials, in many ways they're guinea pigs for a whole new way of communicating and a whole new way of being in community. And so. Uh, when you are a digital native, you are constantly comparing your real life to the curated, idealized Instagram lives of your friends. I never had to go through that. I never had to go through an experience where every time I did something, I was reminded of the fact that other people had more, did more, had more friends, were more accomplished. And quite frankly, they might not even be any of those things, but that's the way they're presenting online. So that's the way I assume they are. Um, and so, because of that, when college kids get to campus, especially campuses like NYU and USC, which are digitally savvy campuses filled with student influencers, they'll see other people uh, on their Instagram feeds and say, everyone's figured it out but me. Everyone has friends but me. Everyone got an A but me. Everyone got into the fraternity but me. Everyone got a job but me. Suddenly you begin to feel like an imposter on your own campus. We did a survey at our Annenberg School and 70% uh, of our students at our Annenberg School, which in my opinion is the best journalism and communication school in the world, um, said they felt like imposters on their own campus. Everyone feels like a, an admissions mistake. And when you're constantly comparing yourself to the curated, idealized lives of others, you don't feel like you belong. You don't feel like you're connected. Your sense of anxiety and loneliness will get ex exacerbated. And so this is the social media generation. And what we're realizing through our data sets is that social media is antisocial. It takes people away from each other. Way before COVID took our students away from each other, their phones took them away from each other. These are students who didn't date as much in college and high school, that didn't drive as much, that didn't go out as much. Why? Because they're at home texting each other. There is a barrier to in-person engagement that makes us feel human. And these are students who have not been, had the opportunity to have those kinds of meaningful relationships. They may have a thousand friends online, but they may say to me that I don't feel like I have any friends in real life, no one who really has my back. Now we're beginning to be a little more savvy. We know that since the release of the iPhone in 2007, we've seen an exponential increase in high school student anxiety, depression, and suicidality. If it's happening in high school, that's what we see in college. Um, and even the people who've made our devices and built our platforms won't let their own kids use them. The more you hang out in Silicon Valley, the more you realize that the people who are the progenitors of these platforms uh, understand their danger more than anyone else. And they won't let their own children use the devices that we so freely hand our children. I got to know Sean Parker a little bit. He was the, one of the founders, uh, he found, was one of the founders of um, Napster and then Facebook. Um, and he told me that uh, he had a falling out with Mark Zuckerberg because he accused Mark Zuckerberg of destroying the mental health of a generation through Facebook. He told me that when we started Facebook, it was before the iPhone. What we were trying to do was create tribe. But once you got likes and once you got an iPhone and once it was in your hand and you could get this dopamine rush, it became a drug that uh, our young people become addicted to and that ultimately these drugs are designed to make them feel worse about themselves. The worse you feel about yourself, the more you come back online. And so they feel this way by design because they're a social media generation. And the second, and here's my own kind of uh, maybe a blind spot here, is that this is a generation uh, that has been raised um, more than any American generation without religion. Uh, in, uh, we all know the numbers. In, two in 1950, 2% of Americans were not affiliated with uh, religion. Uh, today, 20% of Americans are not affiliated with religion. But for my students, uh, my first year students, we did a survey, and almost 50% are not formally affiliated with religion. So 2% of grandparents, 50% of grandchildren. This is the story in American religion. This is a story that uh, is unprecedented and irreversible. These are, this is the trend uh, for uh, uh, um, American religion uh, in a very highly religious society. We are no longer gonna be a predominantly religious country. That's a big deal. Um, and that's why we see all sorts of other kinds of trends across the country. Um, 
75% uh, of mainline Protestant churches are on the verge of collapse. That means we're going to lose 200,000 Protestant churches over the next 20 years. Two thirds of American divinity schools and theological seminaries are about to close because they cannot generate enough tuition to remain financially viable to, due to a lack of student interest in religious vocations or ordination traditions. If you're not a divinity school that's attached to a research university, your future is going to be really challenging. And even though evangelicals have long been a long and powerful, uh, long have long been a powerful political, social, and cultural force in American public life, we know that 65% of American evangelicals will leave their church before they turn 35, and most will never return. And so we are living in this unprecedented age of non-affiliation with religion. I always tell my students, you don't need religion, you don't need God um, to font, to have meaning and purpose in your life, but you do need a framework. And historically, religion has provided that framework. And if you're walking away from the framework of religion, what are you replacing it with? What's your framework for understanding your place in the universe? How do you engage in a meaning-making community? How do you affirm your life experiences and your life stages? Um, and at the same time that students uh, are raised without religion, increasingly they're being raised without a liberal arts education. At schools like NYU and USC, we have pivoted towards pre-professionalism. Our students are, are gonna come to schools like NYU and USC to get the right major, to get the right job, to pay down their debt of $75,000 a year college tuition, um, that's a very different model than I was raised with. I was raised with the liberal arts to, that challenged me to think about who I am, what does my life mean? What does it mean to be a global citizen? How do I think? How do I read? How do I be? What does it mean to make a life, not just a living? Our students don't feel like they have the luxury of that given the high price of tuition and the intense pressures to succeed in a newly emerging economy. And so our students have lost religion and the liberal arts as these meaning making resources at a time when they need it most, the ages of 18 to 26. And so um, I do think that um, the loss of religion plays a big role in what we're seeing with college students. Um, one of my favorite books is a book called The Spiritual Child by Lisa Miller at Columbia University. And in this book is a data point, which I had to confirm with her because it seems so extreme, uh, but it's true, uh, which is that if you have an intergenerational spiritual or religious experience growing up, that means that growing up, if you go, if you have an intergenerational experience of religious community or practice, do you go to a temple, a mosque or a gudvara synagogue? Do you have a spiritual or intentional community that you're part of where you have rituals, uh, ethics, meaning making and community? If you have an intergenerational spiritual experience growing up, you are 80% less likely to suffer from depression as a young adult. And so at an age where we see um, the highest percentage of non-affiliated religious students we've ever seen, and we also see the highest percentage of depression and anxiety that we've ever seen, um, and I know correlation doesn't equal causality, but in this particular case, I believe that I am seeing the results of what Lisa Miller has been talking about in terms of how do you raise a child to be a spiritual child. Now, all of this was pre-COVID. This was pre-COVID. This is the spiritual, mental, emotional health crisis before COVID. These were students who are already in crisis and already lonely before COVID. And then COVID comes around. And now they're going through these apocalyptic ends of days kinds of scenarios. Over the last year, we've had floods. We've had fires. There's been civil unrest. There's a global plague. Uh, locusts descended in huge numbers upon India. I don't know if there's anything more biblical or apocalyptic than locusts. Uh, and so students are looking around uh, and they might have felt uh, uh, un unsteady um, before, and now all of that has been exacerbated by COVID. 80% of students across the country, college students, say that COVID has negatively impacted their mental health and their career aspiration. 80%. At a time when they need each other the most, COVID has cruelly taken them away from each other. And my heart breaks for students who are missing out on the life rituals and shared experiences that make NYU and USC so special, from graduation to sporting events, from study abroad to community service, from in-person mentoring to research opportunities, from late night procrastination in the dorms to late night parties off campus. As undergraduates, what happens outside the classroom, in my opinion, is more important than, when, than, than what happens inside the classroom. And that's what our students are missing during COVID. They're missing the out of the classroom experiences and pedagogies that bring them to an in-person experience with each other. I know how hard it is for our students. They didn't wanna to go to an online university. They came to USC and NYU because they wanted an in-person residential community, but they feel as though they're getting a diminished experience. And quite frankly, as faculty, we feel as though our teaching and our research has been compromised too. It's not just the students who feel this way, it's the faculty and staff who feel this way. 
And quite frankly, what surprised me is that most of my wellness work that I'm doing this year is not with students. It's with faculty and staff who are completely burnt out on my campus um, in ways that they didn't anticipate. And here are three things I see for students and also for faculty staff in this new COVID environment. And you probably see them too or feel them too. The first is obvious, we're all Zoom fatigued. I'm impressed so many people are on this call. Um, we are all Zoom fatigued, everyone feels it. We're not built to see the world in two dimensions. We are built to read nonverbal cues and none of that happens in an online environment. Uh, it's really, really hard to, um, uh, to, uh, to meet someone for the first time and build empathy and trust with them if you're meeting them for the first time online. That means it's really hard for new students, faculty and staff who haven't yet even been to campus. Some of our students, faculty and staff have been at USC, NYU for a year and have never actually been on campus and met anyone in person. That's really hard. Um, that's not why we do the work that we do. We do the work that we do because we're mission oriented and our mission is to be in community. Everything a university does is predicated on being in community from research to teaching, to mentoring, to community service, to patient care, to creative expression. It's an existential threat to the university not to be in person. And so uh, we're all Zoom fatigued. Um, we don't wanna look at screens all day. We don't wanna see the world uh, in terms of like a Brady Bunch uh, aesthetic. Um, we really wanna be together. And um, I noticed that we'd hit maximum Zoom fatigue when I was doing a webinar on Zoom fatigue on Zoom. And I'm like, what am I doing here? I'm just chasing my tail. Like the best webinar I could do is turn off your computer and go outside for an hour. But even the solution is part of the problem in a Zoom fatigued environment. And what we've noticed with students is they came to a lot of events and programs in the fall. They came to a lot of wellness opportunities and worship services on the fall, even though they were online. They're not doing that anymore. They're not coming to big events. They're not, they're just showing up for class. That's it. School for them has been get through class and get the degree. Uh, all the things that make the university so special outside of that have really been compromised because of Zoom fatigue. The second thing I see for students, faculty and staff is a sense of survivor's guilt. Our students are not the most vulnerable in terms of their physical health when it comes to COVID. Um, and so they feel bad about feeling bad. They feel bad for very good reasons. They feel bad that they're not in school. They feel bad that their career aspirations may have been sort of disrupted. They feel bad that they can't be with the people they love. They feel bad that there's so much tragedy and pain around them. But then they feel bad about feeling bad. They think, why should I feel bad? I don't have it so bad. Why should I feel bad? Uh, I haven't lost anyone. Why should I feel bad? I'm physically healthy. And then occasionally we feel good because we're humans. And as humans, we need to feel good. And so there are moments of awe and gratitude and intimacy and beauty that have happened during COVID that might not have otherwise happened. And sometimes we feel good about that. But then students feel bad about feeling good. Why should I feel good about anything when everyone else is feeling bad? And so when they feel bad, they feel bad. And when they feel good, they feel bad. And so no matter what they feel, they feel bad. And that's no good way to live. And that's the sense of survivor's guilt or PTSD that I think a lot of people are still processing. And the third thing that students are really wrestling with is a loss of narrative. I always talk to students about nature versus nurture. Um, nature versus nurture are you know, obviously two ways to think about personal identity formation but we don't choose our nature and we don't choose our nurture. I don't choose how I was uh, raised and I don't choose who I was born to. Although Vinita, as Hindus, my parents always told me, you chose us. That's a very different, you have to have a reincarnation framework for that. But I think most people will assume we don't choose who we were born to and we don't choose how we were raised. So if our personal identity is only a function of nature and nurture, then we have no proactive agency in who we are. But what I tell students they do have agency over is narrative. What I've noticed about myself is that what connects me at age five and 10 and 15 and 20 and 30 and 40, and unfortunately for my wife, I can keep going with those numbers, is that at every age of my life, I'm telling a story about who I am. The story changes, but the act of storytelling doesn't. And I ultimately become the story that I tell myself about who I am. Um, and so the third part of nature and nurture is narrative. That's where we have uh, agency, but students don't feel like they have agency anymore. They don't feel like they're telling their story anymore. They're not the author of their own life journey. Their world is being made for them and not being shaped by them. And so they feel in real intense ways, a loss of narrative over their own life story. And so these three things, Zoom fatigue, survivor's guilt, and a loss of narrative have really challenged, uh, I think, the mental, emotional, and spiritual health of students at a time when many students were already struggling. And I do believe there are gonna be looming challenges ahead. All of us wanna get back to the fall. We can't wait to be back in the fall. We are looking forward to the fall, 
I think the fall is going to be really hard. Why? Because we have to relearn how to be human again. It's not going to be easy to suddenly have a roommate that's less than six feet away from you or to be at a football game with 90,000 people. It's not going to be easy for professors to stand in front of a classroom and give a lecture. It's not going to be easy for me to take off my shorts and put on pants. Like It's not going to be easy for us to go back to so-called normal. It's going to be harder than we think it is. And 20% of our students, for 20% of our students, they actually might be thriving off campus in a way that they wouldn't be thriving on campus. 80% of our students said that uh, COVID has negatively impacted them. But for 20% of our students, it might actually be better. For some students, working remotely gives them other opportunities with work and family. And for many students, especially I find students who might be vulnerable um, in terms of their own mental and emotional health, um, there are serious protective factors that they might have at home or in their home communities or faith communities or friend circles that they don't have on campus. And many, for many of our students, campus itself is the trigger. Campus is the place where I, you know, my girlfriend broke up with me. Campus is the place where I failed an exam. Campus is the place where I didn't get into a sorority. Campus is the place where, you know, I got my first B and now I'm going to be living in a van down by the river for the rest of my life. These are all triggers on campus. And 50% of students see campus as a trigger just because of active shooter scenarios. Um, uh, this is a generation of students that was raised with active shooter drills. Just the very act of being on campus is an anxiety producing act for many of our students. And so uh, I don't think fall will be easy. I think that's where really where we're gonna have to do the hard work in terms of supporting our students. So what can universities do? What can chaplains do, especially for a generation on campus that is increasingly not affiliated with religion? I think the narrative is, in the age of non-affiliation, what's the point of religious life? I wanna argue that religious life has never been more important than it is now, because if the challenge of our day is belonging and inclusion, then chaplains are uniquely qualified to lead, to translate the wisdom of our faith traditions into secular applications for students at a time when they need it most. And here are four themes that we can think about uh, as we think about the future of university chaplaincy in a post-COVID world. The first is, chaplaincy as friendship. Uh, this is something I learned from my colleague and dear friend, Matt Weiner, um, who's the Associate Dean of Religious Life uh, at Princeton and also um, a colleague of Vinit's, that if the problem is loneliness, then a remedy can be friendship. And we have a role to play as chaplains in just being a friend, in just being a friend. When I started as a chaplain, I was in my, I was younger, I kind of felt like an older brother, now I kind of feel like an uncle, <laughs> but really what I want to feel like is just a friend. Uh, I want to be a friend for students who are really struggling in making friends. Like Vineet, I'm trained as a lawyer. And so when I first became a chaplain, I tried to find the remedy for everything. All right, here's the problem. Here's the solution. Here's the problem. Here's the solution. That made me, I think, a pretty bad chaplain because uh, what I realized over time is that the role of the chaplain isn't always to find the remedy. It's to just to be there to honor the experience of the person that's going through something, to affirm their dignity and their humanity, to just be there as witness to what they're going through. Uh, and at a time when students don't feel seen and heard, maybe the most radical prophetic act we can do is just to be with students, to see them and to hear them. It's hard on campuses like NYU and USC with 50,000 students, but every student matters, every interaction matters. And so even if we're doing this in ways that don't seem so work efficient, you know, I spent a lot of time with a few students, um, it's okay. You know, mentoring is not efficient by nature. What we do at a university is not efficient by nature. Efficiency shouldn't be the benchmark for how we operate. It should be impact. And uh, chaplaincy as friendship gives us an impact in the age of loneliness when I think uh, our students really need that. The second is this notion of chaplaincy as tribe. One of the things I try to do at USC, uh, and I know my colleagues at NYU try to do at NYU, is make a big place feel small. How do you make this really big campus and this really big city feel small? How do you make this metropolis feel like a tribe? What we know is that we're tribal creatures. We need a tribe. The history of humanity is the history of being in tribe, being in family, in clan, in kin. Um, it's the history of being with one another. And when we don't have a tribe, it's hard to feel human because what it means to be human is to be in tribe. And our students really lack tribe. They lack intimate interpersonal community on a campus and as, on a city as big as uh, USC slash NYU and LA slash New York City. Um, and so how do we think about tribe? How do we think about intimate community? Well, we do this through our religious groups, through our spiritual groups. We do this through residential life. 
And I think we can do this, do this through other programs. We started a program at USC called Campfire. And the idea is let's just sit around a circle um, in, uh, in, around a campfire. And in our case, it's a virtual campfire on our phones because uh, the fire marshal would freak if we were <laughs> lighting fires on campus, rightfully so. Um, so these virtual campfires, we sit around and we have conversations about what it means to be human, human, big conversations. Um, what we found is that it didn't even matter what the conversations were about. What people really wanted was just to be together. Uh, we, we did the same thing with a class called Thrive. We built a class called Thrive about well-being. Uh, what we noticed is the most popular class at Yale University is a class called the Science of Well-Being. The most popular class in the history of Harvard University in their 350 year history is a class called Positive Psychology. The most popular class at Stanford right now is a class called Design Your Life. These are emotional intelligence classes. These are classes on thriving and well-being. These are classes on lifestyle redesign and they are the most popular classes at the most competitive universities in the world. Um, so our version of that was Thrive. How, how do we build a class that empowers students to be proactive in their own well-being? And we have all these great speakers and all this great content, but what we realized is the real magic for this class wasn't even the lectures or what we were talking about. It was the small discussion groups where students in groups of 15 or 20 could make friends. That was it. Uh, so even when we build things for one reason, we see that the, the reason why those things are successful is because they build, bring people together in intimate community. It almost doesn't matter what that community is, as long as they're together. We do coloring book sessions. We do drum circles. We do um, laughing yoga groups. We have a therapy dog. We, well, I'll, do, I'll steal anything from any university or any kindergarten, <laughs> and I'll, I'll try it. And really, my goal is just to bring students together in small or intimate community. The third theme is chaplaincy as meaning. And I touched upon this earlier. When students walk away from religion, they don't walk away from meaning or purpose or significance or God um, or ritual uh, or, or, or liturgy or text or pilgrimage or all the technologies that we associate with religion. They mostly walk away from religion because they see religion has failed in terms of its own values. And I'll talk a little bit about that in my next point. but. Um, they're desperate for meaning making. They want meaning. They want to talk about what it means to be human. You don't have to even go that deep with students anymore to get real deep. You just have to scratch the surface. Um, and so we've done things like we've started a mindfulness program and a yoga program, which are hugely popular. Um, we've started a sleep class and a happiness class, which are also very successful. Uh, these are not for credit, not for grade classes uh, that are open to our entire university community. We're gonna train 10,000 Trojans uh, in mindfulness practices this, this year. That's a huge number. Um, but what we found is that mindfulness, yoga, these other emotional intelligence sort of framed opportunities are really ways for people to come together and think about meaning. And it, at least on the virtual environment, what we found is when the mindfulness class is over, everyone just sticks around. Like they might hang out after class on campus or in the parking lot. And that's really where the great conversations happen. They just stick around online just to talk to each other about meaning and purpose at a time when we're all being challenged to find it. And so to really uh, engage chaplaincy as a meaning-making opportunity uh, at a time when students don't have religion or the liberal arts um, is I think an important pillar of, of the future of university chaplaincy. And the last one is chaplaincy is justice. Um, this has been a difficult year for students, not just because of uh, COVID, but also because they're engaging in very honest, authentic and painful ways with ideas of justice, equity, policing, racism. Um, and um, many of our students, especially our BIPOC students are working through a lifetime of pain um, in their own ways as they try to be a force for good in the world. And um, for many of us who are scholars of color, um, we can be very sympathetic because that's our story too. Um, what I have noticed is that in these movements to understand justice in, these, um, in this age of diversity, equity, and inclusion, I find that unfortunately religious and spiritual identities, perspectives, and practices are often excluded from those conversations. Uh, and I, I, I can't figure out why. You know, Religious diversity is a big diversity marker. Um, my sense is that um, they're excluded because students have often walked away from religion because they see religion as betraying the values that it promotes. They see, what is religion? Oh, religion is a force that justifies and promotes religious violism or violence or terrorism. It promotes casteism, patriarchy, misogyny, anti-LGBTQ rhetoric, et cetera. And that's true. Religion has done all that and worse. 
But religion is also an inclusive space, a space that creates hospitals and universities, social services and community service opportunities. It's the place of liberation theology and ecological stewardship. Every major civil rights movement uh, in the United States has its origin in the churches. Um, our students don't see religion in that lens. They were raised with, uh, if it bleeds, it leads. And if it bleeds in the name of God, it gets the front page narrative. And so they do see religion as part of the problem. Religion has to be part of the solution as well. And I do believe that the work that we do as chaplains, the interfaith work, the prophetic work is critically important in this age when students are trying to think about equity and justice. Why? Because in interfaith and interreligious work, we have tools and practices and technologies for working across difference, for understanding each other's values and perspectives, for seeing ourselves in each other's experiences, for understanding that we don't have to agree on everything and still yet we can agree on some things and work together on some things. I don't know if, uh, if there's anything more important right now than that kind of consciousness uh, especially for young people in the world who want to go out and be the change that they want to see in the world, inspiring young people who are challenging norms and changing policies in front of our very eyes in real time. Um, I want those students to also benefit from having the kinds of communities that previous uh, social justice and civil rights movements have had. Uh, I am the product of the Indian nationalist movement. My great grandmother was very close friend with Kasturba Gandhi. My, my grandfather grew up around Mahatma Gandhi. That's what shaped my life. Uh, the Indian nationalist movement against British colonialism was an interfaith movement, as Ibu Patel reminds me. It was a movement of Muslims and Hindus and Sikhs and Christians and Jews and secularists coming together to uh, overturn uh, British colonialism in India. My wife is from South Africa. Her family was part of the ANC. Um, her aunt uh, um, was a great leader who um, used to uh, hide Mandela when he was uh, when he went underground, uh, who trained some of the current leaders of the ANC, um, whose own children were killed by the apartheid government when they were training in Cuba. And so my wife was grown up with as part of the, my wife grew up as part of the anti-apartheid movement, and the anti-apartheid movement was also an interfaith movement of people from different religious communities, uh, with different perspectives and identities, as was the American civil rights movement. And we can go on and on and on. And so. I do believe that uh, we should be doing prophetic work as chaplains. We have the mandate, the moral mandate to talk about justice. And part of that justice work is putting a mirror to our own discipline. Uh, as uh, Vinit said, I am the first Hindu in American history to be the chief religious or spiritual leader of a university. I'm so grateful for that honor and to succeed Susan Lemley, who was the first non-Christian to have that role. But in my 12 years as chaplain, I haven't seen a lot of movement in our field of religious life. There may have been one or two other um, non-Christian um, hires, but for the most part, uh, I haven't seen it. Um, uh, there does seem to be a privileging of ordained Protestant ministers within our field. Uh, even as we talk about white supremacy across our college campuses, we never seem to talk about Christian hegemony. Um, and, um, and I just hired uh, Vanessa gomez Brake to be my Associate Dean of Religious Life, the first humanist in American history to have a chief religious role at a, at a college campus, even though almost half our students are religiously not identified. Um, I was so proud to do it, but also a little disappointed that it took so long for someone to do it. Um, we still don't have never had a, a Muslim leader be the chief religious leader of an American university. Um, and so uh, we have a lot of work to do in our own space as well. And um, that's painful work, but I think it's work that we need to do if we're gonna have the mandate to talk about justice and inclusion and equity across society. Um, we have to do that in our own field first. So chaplaincy is friendship, chaplaincy is tribe, chaplaincy is meaning, chaplaincy is justice. That's what we're meant to do. That's what we were trained to do as chaplain. There's nothing more religious than that. That's what prophetic work on college campuses look like in the 21st century. It's different than the 20th century model of chaplaincy like William Sloan Coffin that might've inspired so many of us to do this work. This is a different era with a different set of pressure points and different opportunities. I do believe this is a time of reinvention. Everyone is looking forward to going back to the way things were. We're not gonna go back to the way things were and we shouldn't. Maybe we don't go back to structural racism and healthcare inequity. Maybe we don't go back to abusing animals and destroying our planet. Maybe we don't go back to screen addictions. We've seen the limits of all this now. We've seen what happens when we do all these things. So we shouldn't go back to the way things were. We should reimagine and reinvent the world anew. And throughout our scriptural traditions, our wisdom traditions, our textual traditions, there are moments of plague, there are moments of flood, there are moments of famine that challenge us as humans to reimagine the way that we act and move in the world. 
now is such a moment. And as leaders in the space, um, I, I think this is what we've been training our whole lives for. We've been training our whole lives for this particular moment. And as we think about this, as we think about how we translate the timeless wisdom of our traditions into timely action for our college communities, we can also think about how those traditions, technologies, and perspectives uh, can support us. You know, we are also part of the world that we're trying to save. I see too many of us who are on the front lines of caregiving burning out because we tend to uh, carry the trauma that we encounter in the world with us. We sublimate it and it's not healthy because it emerges in all sorts of other ways. If we are part of the world that we're trying to support and save, then the traditions that have inspired us to inspire others are also life preservers for us in the way that they might be for others. And so uh, those are some thoughts I have on the future of university chaplaincy. I'd love uh, for all of you uh, to sort of chime in and help, you know, I'd love to learn from you, uh, especially if there are chaplains on this call. What do you think the future of chaplaincy looks like? I'm really grateful to turn it over now to my brother from another mother, Vinit. He's not kidding here. Um, my brother's name is Vinish. My sister's name is Vanita. So when you put Vanish and Vanita together, you get Vanit. So Vanit really is my long lost sibling. And I want to acknowledge also how unusual this is that we have two Hindu chaplains here talking about chaplaincy, not talking about Hindu chaplaincy, talking about university chaplaincy. Um, that's really, uh, that's probably never happened before in this kind of context. Um, so Jim, you really are modeling the kind of pluralism that I'm talking about here. Thank you for bringing us together. I want to echo uh, Varun. Thank you so much, Jim, and thank you to everyone who's, who's made this possible. Thank you, Varun, for those stirring, moving, thought-provoking and thoughtful uh, reflections and comments. Um, the questions are pouring in, so in the interest of time, if we could jump right into, um, you know, presenting some of those questions to you and maybe that will um, kind of spawn more of a, a, of a discussion or a conversation. Um, but off the bat, let me ask you um, a, a question that, that comes in that perhaps challenges a little bit um, the, the need or the notion for chaplaincy. Um, and it reads, you make a compelling case for friendship, for tribe, for justice, for wellness, um, but does that compelling case carry over into a compelling case for chaplaincy per se? Um, what does reinventing and reimagining mean um, when it comes to asking the question of, of whether chaplains are, are really the folks to, to uh, play this role? And I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll add, um, I'm trying to combine some of these questions. If that is in fact the case, that chaplains are um, the ones to play this role, then perhaps can we ask who do we need as chaplains? for the future of university chaplaincy? Will these be traditionally religiously affiliated, um, ordained folks as, as perhaps we've seen in, in the past in a very kind of Christian normative sense? Um, or are we, um, should we be thinking about, you know, a kind of a, a wider and broader definition for uh, who a chaplain, uh, you know, who, what, what makes for a good chaplain? Thank you. Those great, great questions. Um, let me take the second part first, and I'll go to the first part. You know, what makes for a chaplain? I, I think you nailed it, Beneath The traditional idea of chaplain is a Judeo-Christian construct. construct. Um, when I tell people, and this might be the case for you, when you tell aunties and uncles, like, you're a Hindu chaplain, they, they don't have a context to even maybe understand what that means. Are you a guru? Are you a swami? Are you a monk? Like, what, what what's this chaplain? And so if we're only going to define chaplains through this lens of ordination and theological training and, and, and clinical pastoral care, we are gonna limit the kinds of um, folks who can be chaplains and, the, and also we're gonna exclude faith communities from participating. Um, we have to come up with a new model of what it means to be chaplains that honors the traditions in and of themselves. Uh, it, and so what I've seen for a lot of Dean of Religious Life jobs now is ordination is not a requirement. I think that's really great. Uh, that's why I applied to the USC job. If ordination was a requirement, I couldn't have become a chaplain. Um, even though I went to Div school, I have a PhD in religion and I do the work of chaplaincy, I would have been excluded because there is no Hindu ordination for chaplaincy. Um, so I think this is an argument for an office of religious and spiritual life. You have to have people on campus who have the kind of religious literacy to be able to certify the right people. Um, I have Buddhist and um, Baha'i and Muslim and humanist chaplains, even though there's not a straightforward path for chaplaincy in those fields as there might be for Christian chaplains. 
And so um, we have to expand how we think about chaplains and what traditions themselves think about chaplains. What are the internal mechanisms that the communities themselves recognize in terms of chaplains? And at the end of the day, it's the individual who matters the most, even more than the training. You know, you could have the best trained person who is a terrible chaplain and then someone who has little chaplaincy training who has an open heart and open mind and does the work really well. And so uh, the individual has to be, the individual is really important there. Why chaplains? Um, here's what I noticed on my campus. I, we cannot hire enough counselors to keep up with the mental health demands. Five years ago, I had 35 mental health professionals on my campus. Now I have 80 mental health professionals on our campus. There's still, a, uh, it changed during COVID, but when students get back, there'll still be a waiting list to see someone. There'll still be a few weeks before you can get in unless it's an extreme crisis. You will still have a certain number of consultations before your um, insurance precludes you from doing that, uh, from seeing someone else. I think you get 12 visits. Um, we have social workers on our campus, but social workers are also downstream in the way that many counselors are. Social workers and counselors on my campus are engaged when students are already in crisis. They're already downstream. They've already gone over the waterfall. And all we end up doing is triaging one student in crisis and then moving to the next student in crisis. But the volume is so great that unless we're working upstream, unless we're making sure people don't get into the river to begin with, unless we're thinking about what's the nutrient in the soil, what's the fluoride in the water, what are we doing to lift all boats? We cannot continue to just be reactive operating downstream, triaging crisis at its most extreme. We have to get ahead of it. And I think chaplains can do the work of getting ahead of it by bringing people together in communities that talk about meaning and purpose, by giving people a sense of ritual that orders their day, by bringing in people into an ethical framework that helps them make sense of the world around them, by making students understand that there's, they're part of a larger universe, that everything is not just transactional in their life, um, and by being there for them in intimate and I would say confidential ways. There's only a few people on a college campus who are confidential. Uh, a, a mental health counselor, a college chaplain, maybe a social worker in certain contexts, an ombuds person. There are very few people that are actually confidential. There is a lot of fear, especially among staff and faculty of reporting anything that you're talking about anything because of mandatory reporting. And then am I throwing myself under the bus? And then am I gonna have retaliation or retribution? We talk a lot about safe spaces. A chaplain is the ultimate safe space. Um, there is a clerical confidentiality that's recognized by law unless it you know, gets to a Tarasov standard, we are very safe. And so I think chaplains are already on university campuses. They're trained in the things that I was talking about. They're trained in friendship, community, justice, and meaning making. Um, they, um, they are already, they're confidential by nature. There, there's no limit, unfortunately to, for me, of how many times you can see a chaplain. We're not limited by 12 visits per insurance. You might not be able to see a counselor for three weeks, but you can see a chaplain within 24 hours. And there's a degree of specificity amongst chaplains that's really comforting for students. A lot of our students may be BIPOC and they wanna see a BIPOC mental health counselor. But you know, for my religious students, it's not that we have a Jewish chaplain on our campus. If you're uh, a conservative or Orthodox or Reconstructionist or Reformed, you can see different folks. If you're Protestant or Catholic or, or Mormon or Pentecostal, you can see different folks. If you're um, uh, ISKCON or Vedanta or Art of Living, you can see different folks. There's so much diversity even within each religious community that students can actually get to denominational sort of perspectives with chaplains in a way that really, I think, um, impacts them in, in a deep and meaningful way. And so, um, I think chaplains are uniquely trained to address these situations. They're already on university campuses and they have a long history of being on university campuses. And the fact that they can be intimate and confidential is hugely important at a time when students don't feel seen or heard. They feel like numbers, they feel like they don't matter. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Varun, you mentioned training a couple of times in that last response, and uh, that's resonating with a lot of the questions that are coming through some, I think, um, more of a kind of um, of an academic nature, but some, as I'm reading them, really coming from a place of of, of uh, wanting some practical guidance on this. And essentially, the questions are are kind of all revolving around this. I feel called to this work. I'd like to do this type of work, or I'd like to do this type of work on a deeper level. Um, what sort of training would you recommend? Where would you point folks towards? Um, to do not just chaplaincy, but to do chaplaincy in higher ed in the ways that you've been describing. 
Yeah, I, I think regardless of your faith tradition, I would recommend divinity school or some version of that theological training that does have a clinical pastoral care um, component to it, like an MDiv degree. Uh, I think now our divinity schools are sufficiently expansive where you can have an interreligious education and a chaplaincy experience without being a Protestant ordained minister. And so there are a lot of new opportunities in that respect. Um, and, um, and then just doing the work. Like if you're a college student, you know, maybe be an intern at your office of religious and spiritual life. Um, most of the students who go on to divinity school that, that I help in, on their journey have come through my office in some way or another. They see the work we do and that's what inspires them. If you don't see it, you're not inspired. I wouldn't do this work if I wasn't, if my mentor wasn't the university chaplain in my time there. And so if you're a college student, I would say spend as much time as you can around chaplains. Um, and, um, and then also maybe just go work at, a, at an office. The, the real challenge, and you know this Vineet, is how do you do this work and get paid? It's not even so much of how you do this work. There are a lot of opportunities to do this work in higher education, in hospitals, in the military, in law enforcement, et cetera. Uh, but getting paid is a different thing. And you and I are, among, are, are like two of the only Hindus in American history who have ever been paid by a university to do religious life work. Um, students say, how do I do what you do? I don't know how you do what I do because I'm not even sure how I did it, quite frankly. I applied with a funny name and an unusual background in 2008 when there was hope and change in the air. Like, you know, like I got this job in some ways because my timing was right, you know, because uh, of Barack Obama's story. He got the nomination when I got this job. I can't plan that, you know, it just happened to be in the zeitgeist. Everything that had always worked against me in that one moment worked for me. Um, so it's hard to plan to do something if there's no path. There isn't really a good path for people who aren't Christian to become university chaplains, but the best place to start, in my opinion, is with an MDiv program. Yeah, um, well, as a fellow 2008, um, you know, zeitgeist onboarder, I mean, that's, uh, I think you're right, there was something very special in that, that um, moment in time. And, um, and I think we both have been blessed with um, wonderful opportunities as a result of that. Um, I wanna switch gears a little bit and um, talk about something that, that we've um, hinted at, but perhaps for some folks is, is a bit of an elephant in the room. And that is a sort of this question, or I, I might even say tension around religious affiliation or disaffiliation. Um, and there are a couple of questions around um, religious affiliation for chaplains themselves, um, but also increasingly for students who, um, as you've been describing, many of whom are not drawn towards religious affiliation and at the same time are incredibly drawn towards this process of meaning making. Um, it seems like you know, some dynamics are shifting there. And we've got a couple of questions asking about that. And in particular, some questions even asking about institutions uh, with religious affiliations and some of the pushback coming from students who wish to see those institutions um, free themselves of, of religious affiliation for, for various reasons, um, including perhaps the stance of a denomination around LGBTQ um, inclusion issues. Um, institutional reckoning with institutional history around racism and slavery. Um, in general, a general sort of perception of religious institutions as, um, as, as, as anti-progressive folks. Um, now you and I know, and you spoke to this, that there is a whole other side to religious institutions and what religious organizations have sometimes been at the forefront of in terms of progressive social justice movements. Um, but how, how would you um, begin to unpack or address this kind of tension around what is the need for a religious affiliation um, for chaplains and even for the institutions that employ them? That's a great question. Um, so uh, listen, I don't, I've only worked at secular research universities. Um, so my perspective really is shaped by the other side of that, which is why is there religious life at all at a secular university? Why do we have a dean of religious life at, at a university that's not affiliated with religion? Why are you doing an invocation before my graduation when I'm not religious? Why am I standing for this invocation, et cetera? So I get the pushback from the other way. 
um, about why have religious or spiritual life at a secular university. Um, I think the first part of that is um, that um, we are a resource for students who are looking for something. We don't have to be all things for all people. We are there for all people. But um, I know that for our 10,000 Catholic students, they're happy that there is a Catholic center and an office of religious life. Uh, same for our Jewish students, our Muslim students, et cetera. When I say that you know, 45, 50% of our students are not affiliated with religion, on my campus, that's still 25,000 students who are affiliated with religion. That's still a huge number. And so we try to support students wherever they're at, no matter you know, that's why we have cultural centers. That's why we have ADA um, offices. That's why we have um, learning differences centers, et cetera. Um, they're not resources maybe for everyone, but they're there for people and students, especially who might need them and benefit from them. Um, so I do believe that there should be a religious and spiritual life shop on every research university campus, public and private. I know most public universities or all public universities have shied away from that. I think there's a constitutional argument that we can make. Um, that's a different conversation, but um, the way we operate at USC, you could operate at UCLA. I am the chaplain for all students, not, I'm not endorsing or establishing one tradition over another. That's First Amendment jurisprudence. Um, and I, I generally don't lead theistically. The first thing I did at USC was I reaffirmed what Susan Lemley had, um, had kind of established, which is our Office of Religious Life is not oriented around God, which seems kind of a wild idea, especially when she took it and built it in 96. Um, but it's instead oriented around meaning and purpose and significance and authenticity. Our Office of Religious Life is not oriented around what it means to be God. It's oriented around what it means to be human because religion is a framework and language that has been constructed and consumed by humans in order to understand the human experience. And so we have a campus full of humans. My job is to be there for everyone as a human. Um, so I think by putting meaning as opposed to God at the center of our work, that's really helped us. Um, I don't generally don't, I'm not very theistic with my language uh, because I don't wanna alienate any, everyone. So even in my invocations, I try to find the things that connect us as humans, as opposed to the things that divide us as theists versus non-theists. Um, my own training in a Buddhist monastery is probably helpful in that regard, because I saw firsthand how you could have meaning-making religious experiences without theism. Um, and, I, and, and framing it. One of the things we did two years ago is we changed the name of our office from the Office of Religious Life to the Office of Religious and Spiritual Life. If I were to do it again, it might just be the Office of Spiritual Life, quite frankly, because that's a broad enough term right now. 70% of our students say they're more spiritual than religious. Uh, I, what I found is a lot of my students were coming to me in their senior year saying, I never came to the Office of Religious, and Lo religious Life because I'm not religious. But now that I see what you do here, I realize that I should have been coming here all along. Um, and so sometimes the word religion can preclude people from participating in a community or an experience that would be very be beneficial for them but the word itself is a trigger or the word itself is exclusionary. And so uh, I think the way we think about language is really important to, too. Uh, and then I would just come back to this notion of, um, of, of, of the role of the Dean of Religious and Spiritual Life. I believe the role of the Dean of Religious and Spiritual Life is to be a chaplain for everyone. I am, I am a chaplain who happens to be Hindu. Um, you are the Hindu chaplain there are two different but very important roles on a college campus. We need both of them, but there needs to be someone who is in a neutral chaplaincy space. And that's why I've been critical of our field um, that oftentimes puts the person who runs the Protestant church on campus in the role of Dean of Religion and Spiritual Life. I don't think the chief Protestant leader who has Protestant responsibilities for Protestant worship services should also be the person who has responsibilities for all worship services. And so I take my role as Dean of Religious Life very seriously. I happen to be Hindu, but I'm at you know, events for Muslim, Jewish, Buddhist. I'm at events for every student group, not just Hindu student groups. Uh, and I really see my job as to, um, uh, to support everyone equally in, in a way that um, everyone feels included. You mentioned- um... and, and let me just, sorry, let me just say one last thing about this, Vineet. The reason why Susan could be the first non-Christian to have this job and I could be the second is because we don't have a university church in the center of our campus. We didn't need to be ordained Protestant ministers because we didn't have liturgical responsibilities. And so something that was structural about our campus has really reshaped the whole way we do religious life. And now our programs are our pulpit. That's where we do, that's where our prophetic work happens, not so much our liturgy. Sure. Yeah. And, and, and uh, to the point of um, 
even where there are structures in place that lend themselves to the dean of religious life or the chief religious um, leader being tied to Protestant liturgical commitments, um, it is possible for those structures to, to change and be changed. Um, and I think we have an example of that even at, at Yale University, for instance, where um, your counterpart is a, uh, a lay Catholic. And from what I understand, there were some structural changes that, that needed to happen and, and Yale to the good work of making those structural changes happen. So I think it's, it's hope giving in that um, you know, change is possible. I wanna stay on this topic just a little bit because there are a couple of questions asking about how we in the field, those of us who are in the field, um, how we might be uh, part of chipping away at what I think you hinted at and what I hear in your, in your comments um, as a kind of an ingrained Christian normativity. And I would even go further and say a white Christian normativity, a white Christian hegemony. And um, as, as one of our friends and, and colleagues, Dr. Kyati Joshi puts it, the, 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 the sort of um, ingrained white Christian privilege. Do you see a, a, a space for chaplains to be part of um, interrogating and, and perhaps even displacing that dynamic? Yeah, I do. You know, there's a lot of talk uh, about intersectionality now, and our students have become much more sophisticated with their intersectionality sort of analyses. Um, I'm really lucky. I went to UCLA Law School and did the critical race program. And my mentor there was Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the phrase intersectionality. And so I got to work very closely with her. And my work with her was really trying to develop a critical religious framework or critical religious studies framework that is parallel to uh, what we saw with feminist legal studies, critical legal studies, and critical race theory, which is understanding how power and privilege is often embedded in the law. And that when you talk about non-discrimination or colorblindness, what you're actually doing is you're continuing to institutionalize a social hierarchy that's embedded in the law. And that you actually have to be race conscious or religious conscious. You have to be anti, have an anti-subordination approach to actually undo what has been embedded. And so um, my hope is that, um, um, that we take what we've learned from critical race theory and think about it in the work that we do with religion as well that we understand the intersectionality between different identity markers, which include both race and religion um, in the lived experiences of the individuals who make up our community. Um, and uh, what I have seen happening, which is really great, is that offices of religious and spiritual life around the country are doing a lot of programming this year around uh, what it means to be anti-racist, around uh, uh, understanding privilege, around social justice, BLM, et cetera. Um, if you look at the newsletters of chaplains offices around the country, um, they've been on the front line of educating um, and programming, um, uh, convening um, uh, students around uh, these challenging issues uh, that we're wrestling with in this moment of reckoning. And so I do think chaplains can lead on anti-racism. Uh, we have the moral authority to talk about prophetic work, but we have to do some work in and of ourselves to see how our own traditions have been part of the problem. And it's not easy, you know, I've spoken out against casteism in Hinduism um, and I get death threats, right? Uh, I'm, there's a petition to ban me from India because I wrote an article about um, how I'm an anti-caste Hindu. Um, there's a lot of trauma that you can take on um, for taking a stance within your own community. But if we're not gonna do it within our own community, uh, communities, it's going to be harder for us to do it within the larger university community as well. I want to go back, if we can, to um, an idea that you spoke about around, um, and I'm going to use slightly different language here, so feel free to push back if I'm not representing this the way you meant, but a, a kind of an intentional decentering uh, of of God from the offices of religious or spiritual life and a kind of centering on the human experience and a centering on the, the idea of meaning, which for some folks is perhaps meaning and God are quite interchangeable. And for others, as you've spoken about drawing from non-theistic traditions and non-theistic approaches, um, God and meaning are very, very different. Um, I wonder if we might sort of massage that a little bit. And if you could speak to where you see um, a newer sort of interest in centering mindfulness in this, um, you know, in, in the narrative. And we see the growth of 
um, mindful NYU, mindful USC, mindful Elon. I mean, it's just sort of this mindfulness seems like almost like a, a movement unto itself, um, sometimes very much connected to its kind of religious and cultural roots, you know, in, in, in Buddhist and, and, and other traditions, um, sometimes it kind of existing um, as, as its, its, its own um, kind of movement. Uh, where, what are your thoughts about this and where do you see this as going? Do you see this as a kind of um, a move away from religion and towards mindfulness? Or do you see another relationship between those two concepts? Thanks, Benit. Yeah, you, you're, you're quite astute. I, I didn't say it, but that's sort of what I was hinting at, a decentering of God in terms of the, my own public voice. I talk a lot about God with students who want to talk about God, but I have a community of 70,000 people who represent 150 countries in every faith tradition in the world. If I'm talking about God, I know I'm going to lose people. But if I'm talking about what it means to be human, I know I can engage more people. And so I try to focus on that in my own public comments. Um, but I have 50 chaplains who speak a lot about God and do worship services and liturgy and lead um, students in prayer, et cetera. Um, with mindfulness, um, you know, it's, uh, you're right. It, every major American university has a mindfulness program uh, during COVID. Uh, I think it's become the go-to resource for a lot of people. Um, it, mindfulness hits the sweet spot of being both spiritual and scientific. All the research and data, we have now 20 years of peer-reviewed studies about mindfulness. I think John, John Kabat-Zinn put the first mindfulness study out 20 years ago. Uh, and last year, there were like eight or 900 peer-reviewed studies. So there's just been an explosion of scientific sort of data that uh, allows us to think about mindfulness as a secular wellness resource, not as a spiritual opportunity for enlightenment. Those are two very different things. Mindfulness has its roots in Buddhist practice. It has its roots in the Pashna and the Theravada tradition. Um, uh, the roots of mindfulness are uh, uh, liberation from the cycle of suffering and rebirth. And now it's, you know, can I get calm before my test, right? Very different. Um, as a academic, I am a little concerned about the cultural appropriation of mindfulness and yoga from Buddhist and Hindu practice, the way it's been framed and sort of taken away from its Vedic roots um, and offered as uh, in some ways like a, uh, as something that make you feel better in Lakot, right? Um, I live in LA, so that's, that's the way yoga is framed. Uh, it's good for your abs, not just your chakras. <laughs> but um, but as a chaplain, I don't have the luxury to be that concerned about it because I am desperate, desperate to offer anything to my community that I see uh, as being in crisis. And the fact that 10,000 people are taking a not-for-credit mindfulness class this year at USC uh, has proven the concept to me that they're finding it helpful and meaningful. And so I think there's some intellectual interesting intellectual debates that we can have about how is mindfulness being appropriated or framed or positioned or branded. Um, for me, I, I, as a chaplain, I'm just trying to do whatever I can to help people and uh, mindfulness and yoga, uh, because they've been accepted by American culture, 30 million people meditate in the United States and 20 million have tried yoga. I don't even have to sell mindfulness or yoga. Uh, I send an email out to 75,000 people every semester talking about here are some free mindfulness classes. I am waiting for the response that says, why are you trying to push Buddhism onto a secular campus community as a quasi Buddhist? I have yet to receive that email. All I get is why aren't you doing more? Why aren't there more classes? We, why, why, isn't, why isn't there a better app? Why isn't there this or that? Uh, all people want is more. And so um, it feels to me like this is a resource that's really working. Now, I think the opportunity here is we know that mindfulness is secularized Buddhism. We know that yoga is secularized Hinduism. What does secularized, what are secularized practices from other faith traditions that can be brought into a secular wellness space, right? How do chaplains mind their own traditions in ways where they can decenter the theological underpinnings that might turn students away from a particular practice and recenter the wellness benefits that students desperately need? I don't think we can be purists anymore in this work. I don't think we can, unless we're academics, but if we're on the front lines of the work and we see the pain and the trauma, then um, I think we're gonna end up sort of trying everything we can. I don't mind, honestly, as a chaplain, putting 10 things out there and seeing if two or three stick. I don't mind failing seven or eight times if I can get to something that works. 
Um, I think we all need to be really experimental now in mining our wisdom tradition for practices or perspectives or pedagogies that we can secularize and offer in different ways. That's what religion has always been about. Religion has never been about the transmission of the exact same values in texts and rituals. Every generation has to reimagine religion in their own way. Every generation interprets texts in their own way. Um, that's why religion endures. The religions that endure are the religions that are the most malleable. The texts that are endure are the texts that are open to multiple interpretations. That's why the Constitution of the United States endures, because you can read anything you want into that document. It's so uh, malleable. It's so open-ended, like our wisdom text. If it was so hyper-specific, we wouldn't know about it. It would be irrelevant at this point. And so this is what religion has always been. Religion has always been a creative reinterpretation by different generations across space and time. I, I think we just have to sort of get back to that in a in a secular way now. So beautiful. Thank you so much. I um, I just want to appreciate your your raising of this like pragmatic voice, which so often gets lost in all the discourse, right? Um, and and as you said, um, for those of us who who do feel called to be on those front lines, whether it's the front lines um, in a in an emotional, mental wellness sense, the front lines of crisis intervention, the front lines of meaning making, um, we don't have the luxury of um, sort of, you know, analyzing things to death. We are, as you so beautifully put it, um, we're in that space of, of trying to facilitate whatever works. And, uh, and I so much appreciate that. Um, Varun, there, there are so many questions coming in and I'm trying my best to kind of, kind of conflate and combine them. There's also just a lot of appreciation coming in. And um, you probably know this already, but you have quite a fan club. And so um, they are here in, in full force, just appreciating you as, as, as I am right now. My heart feels so full. Um, we are, and uh, we have arrived at the end of our time together. Um, I do wanna ask one final question though, and I'm gonna try my best to combine a couple of the questions. Um, but one of the things that is so just inspiring um, and awesome about what you do is um, how you, really hold space and manage relationships with a very, very diverse team. Um, you, you mentioned, I think, something like 90 student organizations and more than 50 um, you know, ministers uh, from, from various traditions. Um, and that is just so incredible. And so there are some questions that are just asking for some guidance and inspiration on how we can encourage our affiliated chaplains and volunteers and team members on college campuses, um, how we can we can support them, and how university chaplains can support all faiths and not just traditions that they may be more familiar with or that they may observe. Um, from an administration administrative standpoint, um, what what resources are there for chaplains um, to be fluid while rooted for all? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I'm really lucky. Uh, my predecessor, Susan Lemley, built the office and I get to have fun with it. Um, and she did something that has made our office possible early on, which is find a way to support chaplains. We can't financially support our chaplains. Um, we don't have the money, but there's also, I think, some challenges around First Amendment issues. Like, I, So we have external organizations who support our chaplains. Um, the Institute of Knowledge supports our Muslim chaplain. The Badanta Center supports our Hindu chaplain. Um, you know, Hillel and Chabad support our Jewish chaplains, the Archdiocese supports our Catholic chaplains, et cetera, et cetera. So we do work with local organizations in order to support chaplains, but they're not paid by the university. That being said, they have university IDs, they have ID cards, they have email addresses, they can apply for room reservations. We have monthly chaplain, chaplains meetings. They're part of interfaith events. They're on the stage during our baccalaureate services. And perhaps the most important thing for chaplains in a city like Los Angeles is that they have preferential parking spaces. <laughs> you, you can't put a price on that uh, in LA. So um, I think that um, show, if you support chaplains, then they're gonna be better situated to support you. And I learned that from Susan and I haven't really changed the model that much. It works so well. Um, and so I think that's the an, an important thing bring chaplains together. Our monthly chaplains meetings are never about theology or text or tradition. They're always about best practices. How do you do an event better? Where are sources of funding? What happens if there's a threat? How do we refer people to the counseling center? You know, what, what are best practices for fundraising? 
They're always about how do you do your job better? And if I can help support my chaplains in doing their job better, I know that they're gonna support our students in the work that they do better. And so I think it's a two way street. Uh, chaplains are often unsupported, unpaid, un sort of recognized. Uh, you really have to have a calling to do the work if, if you're working in those kinds of environments. Um, but uh, universities have symbolic capital too. They don't just have um, economic capital, they have other kinds of capital to support their chaplains and lift their profiles in ways that help their students. And so I would say that's one step. The second thing I've learned during COVID is, um, is, is pretty obvious, which is just be human. Um, before we're Hindu or Muslim or Christian or Jewish or atheist, whatever, we're human. That's the one thing that connects us. We're all humans on a human journey. I love the, um, the, the quote by uh, Pierre Deschardins, uh, the uh, uh, Jesuit priest, um, who said, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience, we're spiritual beings having a human experience. Um, I think during COVID, we can all mine our own experiences and just assume other people are feeling that way. If we're feeling anxious and Zoom fatigue, others are probably feeling that way. If someone smiled at us and it made us feel better, well, smiling at someone else might make them feel better. If someone called us for no reason and lifted our spirits, well, maybe if we call someone for no reason and lift their spirits, it'll make them feel good. If I got a note of gratitude, well, maybe I should send a note of gratitude. Uh, the things that I'm experiencing aren't going to be that much different than other humans because we're all part of the human family experience, journey, community, et cetera. And so now more than ever, as you work with different stakeholder groups and on my team, I have 50 chaplains in one office and I have 25 people in another office who are social workers, threat assessment professionals, lawyers, et cetera. They're all, they're all operate in different ways and they do different work, but I just try to be human and it goes a long way, especially at a large bureaucratic institution where it's not just that students don't feel seen and heard, it's that faculty and staff don't feel seen and heard or appreciated as well. And so just honoring everyone's experience, being there for them in a non-judgmental way, and also just acknowledging that we're going through a challenge right now can go a long way towards improving work productivity and efficiency, even though that's not the reason we do all those things, that's a really nice byproduct. People feel if they're valued, they feel like they, 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 they wanna add more value. If you're loyal to folks, they'll be more loyal to you. You know, people ultimately will treat you the way that you treat them. And so there is a way there in thinking about, well, who are the bosses that I liked and how did, why did I like them? And how can I be in that? How can I operate in the same way now? Beautiful. I love the idea of operating from that standpoint of, of being personal, of being human, that I think it's just such a lovely note to close on that we can carry with us to reflect on how I can be more deeply human in the work that I'm called to do. Um, again, Farun, just so, so grateful to you. We also wanna take another moment to, again, acknowledge the partners who have made this very special event possible, the Luce Foundation, um, NYU Steinhardt School, and the Of Many Institute for Multi-Faith Leadership. Um, Varun, again, I really, I have no words for um, just how uh, impactful you've been in this time and, and just how grateful we are for your generosity of, of, of time and wisdom and your sharing of, of best practices and what excites you and inspires you in this work. Um, finally, we wanna thank all of you in attendance and I apologize if we weren't able to get to everyone's question, but we wanna thank all of you for making the time to learn and reflect with us together. Um, these are ongoing conversations and we hope that you might join us again for our next loose lecture uh, it will be on October 28th and will be a talk by Jessica Cooperman from Mullenberg College. So again, with that, thank you all. Thank you, Jim. And uh, please have a, a blessed rest of your day, rest of your week. And until we meet again, thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone.